Hey guys. Uh, I'm, I'm going to try to not use the microphone. Can you guys hear me? Yeah? Bradford, can you hear me? All right, they can hear me. Shut up, Bradford. All right. All right, guys, thank you so much for having me. Uh, this is incredibly intimidating. Um, I am not a designer uh, by any stretch of the imagination. I am an event planner. I used to run events for Thrillist. I threw crazy events from cocktail parties to concerts to mystery flyaways to Jamaica. And I just kind of got sick of trying to make the events look as good online as they did in my head. Right? Uh, we used to call them micro sites. They were really hard to create. And about, uh, it was actually about four years ago we started working on this thing. And man, it's been a hell of a journey. I mean, I'd love to hear by show of hands, how many of you guys are in a startup right now? Like, yeah, a lot of us. Shit is fucking hard, excuse my language. It is really hard, and we've been building this product. Um, I, I hope you guys, maybe, you, I bet you've RSVP'd to a dot splash that event. That's us, we're Splash. Um, basically, I've hired some of the smartest and uh, coolest designers in the world. There are actually two of them over there. Mike, would you raise your hand? He's so cool, he's tweeting. Yeah, I love my guys, so do talk to us. We are indeed hiring. But what I want to talk to you guys about is kind of a, a moment that saved our business. Um, and in a lot of ways, it, saved, it was our product. Uh, that saved our business. So this is what we call ourselves, experiential marketing technology. Um, oh, this thing's not working. How do I, what do I do? I turn it off already? Uh, boom, uh, am I just doing it wrong? Click that button, no? All right, you can, I can just tell you when the next slide is. See how it goes, all right, whatever. Yeah, next slide, please. <laughs> So guys, this, the idea is, and this is my dream. I'm an event planner, I wanna solve this entire thing. I wanna own every single event, but in order to do that, I needed to go after the people who actually threw the raddest events. Thank you, sir. And the people who throw the raddest events are brands, right? We all know this. People who, throw, who understand that design and creativity power experiences and the experiences that we're having right now, these very important moments, often are powered by the people with budgets, right? And so that's who we started attacking. But this is what happened. We went down the road now. We built Splash 1, and we built Splash 2, and they were both, they didn't meet their needs, right? Um, if you think about the confirmation email, to the reminder email, to the post, event, you know, uh, post event website, to the save the date, all of these different components, really difficult to scale that designable, right, customizable product for Anheuser-Busch, which by the way, like I just call it Anheuser-Busch. Anheuser-Busch will power this year alone 106,000 events on Splash this year, right? You can imagine the design needs they have. All of Sundance, right? Like MLB, we're powering right now the NBA.com. This is a crazy product that needs to scale to designers' imaginations. And the bottom line, guys, it wasn't. It just really wasn't. Because um, this is what we were trying to accomplish completely white label and fully customizable. We need something that everyone in this room loved to use. And that is super duper hard. So um, yeah, i.e. the hardest challenge ever. Um, so what we did was we hit the drawing board. And so what I'm gonna tell you guys about tonight, and I'll go fast through it, but anybody who's creating a CMS, anybody who's creating a product that they want to essentially make their users make themselves look good, right? To essentially create those boundaries so their users look good. I think you'll find a lot of value in this talk. Um, but these are our three goals, right? Number one, so this is, what, this is what happened. We invited a bunch of designers into the office and we asked them to use our tool and create themes. What we found was that there was a big difference between those who were print designers and those who were web-based designers. So a big goal of Splash 3 was to really bridge that gap between web and print. Number two, we wanted designers to be able to implement. We knew and we saw over and over again that the language barrier between a designer and a developer, we had our developers implementing these pages and things were getting missed and they were getting lost in the process. We needed designers like my guys over there actually implementing and they needed to love it, right? And that's hard. And then the bottom line was we had 300,000 users right now and all these insane brands. If we alienate, we're, we're changing the engine at 30,000 feet. If we alienated our existing users, that's bye-bye for our startup. So th those are our three goals, right? Keep all those things in line. So here are the 10 things we did. And, I'll share, and actually, let me caveat all of these things. You'll see here at the end, we're already working on Splash 4. We're not there yet, but I'm really psyched about what we came up with, and I think we learned a lot. I think you guys can get a lot out of it for what your projects are, but it's a never-ending battle. Always working, and yes, still hiring. All right, number one. 
This was actually, this was our first move, and by the way, I actually at this point think this is the wrong move, but it was really important for us to stay alive while we did this. We divided our user groups into two different people, right? There were designers, and we'll talk about what those and by the way, designers are not designers, those are basic users, but we wanted to call them designers so they felt good about themselves. And then there were really like designer pros. We call those guys builders, right? Those are like, actually, those are you people. Anybody who knows Photoshop, or yeah, that's, those are the people we're talking about. Um, we, we needed to divide those people out to kind of create those barriers. I don't know that that's not the right strategy, but I do know that we probably didn't set uh, the barriers in the exact right place. So we're revisiting that. And actually what we found out while we were doing this was, there were actually three user groups. There were people who needed to code, and they needed to jump into code. Just so you guys know our goal, I would literally walk up, and my designers hate that when I did this, I would walk up behind them, we built our own CSS editing tools, and I'd walk up and make them count the lines of CSS. I'm a really nice guy in general, but I did ask them to do this. To count the lines of CSS, and basically get all the way down to zero, we wanted to create zero lines of code to create a mobile responsive site. That was the goal, and that still is the goal. Your wildest imagination in print on the web, right? From a designer. And so we were that's what we were doing, but we still needed this in order to bridge the gap. Okay, so really three user groups. Next, we went after themes. You needed a base, you needed a starting point, right? Now, we realized, and this was through a lot of user testing and no surprises here, designers love to start from scratch, right? They love it. They want a blank sheet of paper, and that made a lot of sense, so we created, we called foundation themes for the real professional designers. Um, basic users, they don't want to start from scratch, they don't want to do anything. They want to click a button and send their invitations out and invite all their friends to their events. So we basically used those themes and created a bunch of really cool looking things and we'll talk about how we made them still feel like they were creating in a bit, right? And then brands, brands don't want either of those things. Brands don't want anything, they just want to click go, especially when you're dealing with like huge brands that just want to make sure their people who are working for them are just operating on brand. So we need to create themes that really made sense for those brands. So really three theme types. That was the first step. Moving forward. This, and by the way, let me actually take a step back and say, none of these things were my ideas, not one of them. <laughs> Everything I'm talking about were the people that work with me's ideas, um, I'm just taking credit for them. Uh, but really, like, this one in particular, this was the one. And, um, you know, I, 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 I know, like, we all, like, used to build with blocks as kids. Um, when my team brought this to me, it was, like, kind of a, a aha moment. This bridged the gap. And so I wanted to kind of put this right up front. Blocks. Blocks are essentially, so we went after like content blocks and we wanted to basically make it so that anyone could build a page with, right? Speaker block, sponsor block, audio block, and I don't know, map block, right? Um, so that's what we did. And, but the important part was to build it in a way that could talk and that they could share. And so block libraries became a really big deal for us. Being able to share your blocks, to save your blocks, and really a block, and I think I have it here, yeah, a block is just an arrangement of, of elements, right? It's just, and elements are quotes and headlines and speakers, right? Just all put together in the perfect way. That's how we start. We started really breaking this down into a granular fashion. Pretty interesting, but, and I'm telling you, just even using the word blocks, now we have like block parties, you guys are all invited. It's like awesome, right? Um, blocks really changed the game for us and allowed us to cr come up with a unit that we could all use and all save and all share. That was a really big advancement for this process. But, so we create all these blocks, and it didn't work. It didn't work at all. You know, I will say that my thesis on building product is um, you can have a sweet idea and you can think you have the right strategy, but if, if you're not in the field and you're not actually doing it, um, it doesn't matter. It's not gonna, you don't really know if it's gonna work. And really a lot of this stuff, what I'm reporting to you now, was a lot of our failures that we had to figure out. And while I call it splash three, this is actually probably like 3.5, right? Uh, we screwed this up a lot. The first thing we learned was that for blocks to work, they needed to inherit the properties of the theme automatically. Let me show you an example. This looks really simple, right? Yeah, like a headline and an underline and these cool people and a copy, right? This is a block, but for this to work on your page and not be super annoying to add to the page, it needs to inherit the fonts, it needs to inherit the colors, that's kind of it, right? It needs to inherit any kind of potential default content that you already have. That bridge was a really big deal for us, right? Inheriting properties. So we built that, psyched about it. All right, next. Okay, this was the mother beast. When we realized this one, we cut, it was one of these, right? 
we basically like there look at this one right okay cool now add another block click add another block with one but add another speaker with one button you do it and it doesn't come in with all the properties that you already set right we were idiots we fixed it so basically we call it repeatables I want to let you guys know, and I'm putting a stake in the ground here, repeatables are going to change our entire business. I think repeatables are the coolest thing in the world. Basically, a repeatable is the ability to create a template for a list item. Here are two examples of repeatables. This is BarkBox's uh, homepage. This is a map that comes in, you style up the master, you click one button, and now the next block looks exactly like that. Over there, that's a repeatable applied to a speaker section, right? And you basically create a master, you click one button, and it comes in with the correct formatting, right? You can imagine how very frustrating it was when you design up a whole speaker block, you click one button, and it comes in with very different design properties. That was a bummer. Again, I know it seems really obvious in retrospect, it really wasn't at the time, um, but here we are, so it works. Um, as I said, I, I really see this being the thing that allows, and has allowed our very basic users to click one button and feel like they're designing because they're adding a new block and it looks all awesome. Uh, this is what enabled that, repeatable functionality, setting the master, right? Okay, running through it. This one was crazy. Okay, so what was happening was that, and this one I think you can apply to pretty much anything that you guys are doing. What was happening was that people were going into, let's say, their headline, and they were changing the color. And then they were going down to their body type, and they were changing the color. And then they were going down to the borders, and they were changing the color. And every single time they did it, they picked a purple, let's say, but it was a different shade of purple. Even if it was a small, like very small difference, it was still a different purple. A really big advancement that we had that allowed us to scale to this level was essentially inhibiting their ability to put a lot of colors on the page. I think we all know fewer colors, better design, right? Pretty much. So what we did was we came up with a concept of color swatches. The idea is that really at the very onset of when you start creating your page, we give you a bunch of color swatches, but really you set the color swatches. And you don't set things by element, you set it by swatch, right? And you can see if you click one, one of these color swatches, right, it doesn't say, hey, cool, do you want to edit all the different elements? It just says you want to edit the master swatch, right? And you're editing just that one swatch. That allowed us to, via the flow of our tool, keep consistency in the tool. And as you can tell, over here, all it takes is to change this to this. You just click this button, click, 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 and all the swatches change. Phew, we got through that. And it's working. That, actually, that strategy's working really, really well. Inhibiting colors was a really big deal for us. And making via flow, making them change only the colors on a master level, not on an individual level, really big deal for us. And we applied that same thinking to fonts. We all know fewer fonts, better design, right? On a simplified level, you guys are the designers. But right over here, same idea. You're managing your color swatches. These are a list of color swatches, sorry, of font combos on the left. And you can see with one button, you can change your entire, all the font combinations. We found pretty quickly that certain font combinations worked better for certain pages, obviously, right? So what we started to do was, we started really getting strategic with which font combos were headlines, which were more body, right? But at the end of the day, if you want to change one font, it changes the font that's applied to all of them. I know it seems really simple, but that was one of the hardest things we had to figure out, and I'm psyched to announce that it's in the tool and we're psyched. Cool? So there it is, and this is Ben's incredible awesome party. One other thing, guys, and I actually want to call this out because this is my personal favorite thing that I've ever built ever. I didn't build it, but I asked someone to, is, um, font auto resizing. The coolest thing ever. I talked about a big thing we were working on was trying to get web and print to kind of talk, right? Basically, we've, we realized that fonts are real lockups. So people are like hacking, using our RT, RTE, they were hacking all the font sizing to create their perfect lockup, but they weren't thinking about it from an infinite screen size basis. So that when they looked on mobile, the, the lockups didn't look the same. Real bummer, and you can imagine people weren't psyched. What we built was font auto resizing so that you basically say, hey, per line, I, own, I want it to change size, right, automatically. I know it seems really small, but look how cool that looks. I mean, that's awesome, right? And look, this one too, yay, right? You can see it, it changes, and like I could keep on typing in the middle line, it would just get smaller and smaller, because what we realized was that the shape of the text was actually what people were responding to, and so we built that. Really cool, I'm psyched about it. All right, this one was tough. So as I said, we're trying to appeal to designers, we need designers to love it. We needed to essentially build something that felt very similar to Photoshop. 
So we did. Um, this is our layout bar. You can see kind of on a top level, and this is kind of on a dive-in level, right? The layout bar. We really tried to make. We tried to follow a lot of the same things that Photoshop did: um, folder structure, wrapping, a uh, group of elements. You know, we think about that as like a container. You know, in Photoshop, it's more of a folder, but we created containers. Um, creating those containers to organize, dragging and reordering happens from this level, and renaming. Renaming was a really big deal, right? We, we realized pretty fast that people's like, stuff just didn't, they weren't able to navigate well. We needed to build renaming. So we need to make it look like Photoshop. Actually, so at this point, do you mind just throwing on that video? Uh, you can just see just kind of what it looks like in action, um, this nav bar. I know this seems like kind of basic in retrospect, but this was one of the hardest things we've ever had to build ever, right? We were working on this for so long. Um, you'll see kind of how robust it is. I'm just curious, has everybody raised hands? Does anyone use Splash? Wow, only a couple? Okay, guys, it is the most, thank you, Bradford's the man. Yeah, guys, this is a, this is just a quick video of, of kind of how you can use our nav bar. Right, so you click on things, you can hide or unhide elements. This is a speaker thing. You can reorder by dragging, right? You can dive in, so we just dove into the quote block. Right? You can change the background very easily. You can see that we're inhibiting the colors, right? Right? S same thing with font color, right? Cool. And then it's all live type on the page and adding in line. Awesome. Up, oh, yep, yeah, and really just kind of drop in your content. I mean, the idea is to make it that easy. Oh, I think it's a little bit more. Oh, even letter spacing. Nice. <laughs> yes. Okay, cool. All right, cool. Back to the prezo. Guys, I, and so look, if you haven't used Splash, um, shameless plug, you should. Um, <laughs> uh, we, uh, it's awesome. I, I look, I'm going up here. I'm on video right now. I think this is the greatest CMS ever built. Um, I, I mean it. Uh, I'm coming after you, Squarespace. I know you're out there. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Seriously, this thing is insane. So check it out. And um, we, as I said, we divided our users into like not designers and designers, so we'd be happy to grant you like real designer access, but if you're interested, come on by and we'll show you how to use it, or you can figure it out yourself, but it's really robust, you can create anything using it, and not for nothing, on the back end is the most badass CRM ever. Anyway, I'll shut up, all right. So, another thing we need to build, and this applies to that layout structure, we needed to build mobile responsive tools. We need to make it so you could set things on mobile and they looked exactly as you wanted them to on mobile, single source of truth, right? So we did it, and that's what it looks like, and that's how you edit. Same functionality applying to the mobile web. Cool? And this is what we really learned at the, really towards the end of our process that like, yeah, we built all this really badass stuff, but at the end of the day, you gotta give people really awesome stock photography, and so we spent a lot of time picking out a, really, a bunch of really cool photos, and give them the right answer when it comes to copy. Like, you know, they should come up and like laugh. What we talk about it internally is that the creator of a splash page should have the same level of excitement as the person receiving the splash page, right? It should feel like you just got invited to an event. Um, so what we did is we unleashed our copywriters on it and we made it so it was really fun and people enjoyed using it and hopefully they didn't need to change the copy and frankly, very few people do change that copy, which is cool. Um, and then we call it fuck yeah, I mean, excuse my language. Uh, that's a big part of our business. Uh, this is events, you know I mean? This isn't like, I don't know, what else? I don't know, it's like Shopify, I don't know, it doesn't suck. It's events, like we're having fun, <laughs> right? Like, no, Shopify's awesome, just like, I don't know, it's events, come on. <laughs> I don't know, there's probably like a Shopify guy here. Um, but yeah, we really did need to like, kind of take it up a notch to play in this space. So we did a bunch of like, here's a couple of cool things that we're doing, um, and this won't end, but this is where we're at now. Color overlays, we want to make that super easy to like, change the opacity and drop in a cool color overlay makes a really big difference. Oh, by the way, you can see this is again the font resizing, really tight, yeah. Um, hover states, I just grabbed a screenshot of like the hover state editor. You need to be able to like really edit hover states and like mess around with it and have fun with it. Hover states are the best part of the web. Uh, um, Mapbox, this is live now. Do you guys know Mapbox? Okay, if you don't know Mapbox, you gotta get into Mapbox. Okay, maps are huge, like, garbage on every single website. They are so gross on Google. Mapbox basically made it so you can customize any map. We built that right into the tool so you can customize all your maps on Splash. This is so awesome because now, look at that! It's awesome! <laughs> That's like, you, don't, you can't see the rest of the page. The rest of the page is red and like, how cool is that to like, really customize your map? That's awesome. Um, the coolest of all time. <laughs> Shout out to Giphy, you're gonna hear from Julie in a sec. Yes, you can just drop GIFs on your page. We're really psyched about that. 
This one's coming in July. Obviously, we need a type kit. Yes, I know. We have a bunch of cool type. We like I, I chose a lot of the fonts. Mike over there chose most of them. We have a lot of cool fonts, but type kit's gonna change the game for us. Really psyched about that. And then, guys, like I just want to show this off. Like this is I don't know. I've been really excited to show this or just talk about this. This is when we knew. Like one day we got an email. The designers at Spotify, who like we super respect, hit us up and we're like, hey guys, we were using your designer tool and we built this. And we were like, oh cool, like they just dropped like an image on it, right? Like they didn't really like use it. They were like, that's not text, but then we dove in, like they used the tool and they didn't call us and they didn't freak out, they didn't complain, they didn't even ask any questions, they just used it. And like, as I mentioned in the beginning of the talk, like, we were running into some serious issues as a business. We couldn't implement pages. Developers are too expensive and it just wasn't turning out right and we couldn't scale our product. We got this email and like, I don't know, I got shivers, like I knew, like this is it. Like, and right now, I mean, I can't tell you, there's some just badass companies that are using our product and like designing how they want to design and they're doing it fast and they're having fun. There are a lot, there's still bugs, like we're working on it, you know, and if you guys use it, I hope you'll send feedback. Come by. We have designers come by and just talk to our team all the time, so I'd love to have you. Yeah, this was a big day for us, and I, I, was, I was really psyched. Um, but yeah, like, I don't know, especially, again, we're hiring. If you want to work on this, you should come talk to us, but Splash 4 is going to fuck some people's brains up, so I'm really excited about that. So yeah, guys, anyway, that's it. Thanks for having me. And I'm supposed to stick around for questions? Yeah, yeah time for questions. Um, if you've got questions, shout them out. Yeah, go ahead. How big is performance for each of these sites? Just repeat the question. Uh, your question is how big is performance? Right. Uh, how, how do you mean? Uh, how many people are using each theme? More like uh, page loading, things like that. You're loading all these themes and assets and apps and all that. Wow. Uh, are you a developer? Or? Awesome. Um, that's a great question. We've done a lot of work to essentially separate, right, uh, essentially the JavaScript that controls that from the rendering engine that controls the, the view, right? Um, they should load really fast and they should be loading faster. Let us know if it, you know, how it works for you. Um, but it, that was a huge challenge, right? Um, and yeah, every single time we add something, there is definitely that concern. It's an it's a ongoing, ongoing challenge, yeah. Bradford, what do you want? Oh, I bet you do. What's up? How many events have been on Splash? Yeah, so uh, it's really exciting. Um, this year, there's going to be something like about a half a million events and about 10 million RSVPs this year. What is the most popular kind of event? Um, they, it's really, honestly, launch events, they call them, and we've been asking kind of type-wise, we're finding that it's, it's company-driven events. The way we describe our product is if your business throws events for like a business needs and you're marketing through your events, not necessarily marketing your event, that's like ticket sales, and we do power tickets, this is crazy, we're gonna make, uh, we have powered so far about $5 million in tickets this year, really crazy, I'm psyched about that, but that's not our core competency, our core competency is if your, use, your, your event represents another revenue stream, another part of your business. Yeah, it's not, you know, people do use it for bachelor parties. We're powering like bar mitzvahs in Long Island this yeah. weekend. Yes, I'll go. Um, but no, the real core users are people who, like, who get why design matters. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, in the back. Uh, you mentioned Squarespace as a competitor. Are, you, are they a competitor in the sense of events that will be the wedding website on Thursday? Are they a competitor in the sense of you eventually want to take over that? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think Squarespace has built the most insane CMS ever and really controlled their design so that everyone looks super awesome. That said, and I, I think of myself as a very novice designer, I have a very difficult time implementing pages. Um, it, from my imagination, right, from scratch. Um, I do want to beat them in that way. I want to make it so everyone here can really like develop in a way and actually like put up a mobile responsive page. Um, they're not really a competitor in the way, like if you knew the amount of back end necessary to manage Budweiser Made in America or Spotify House at South By, it's like mind boggling. So I'm never that worried. But uh, from a CMS standpoint, we look to them from a design inspiration. And yeah, I mean, there's some other really good ones too, like WebDio came out, or WebEdo, or whatever. They came out with a new one today. They were pretty tight. Um, there's some other good ones, Canva. But yeah, oh, we've got to look at Squarespace. They have a ton of money and have done really well. <laughs> I don't know if that answers your questions. Yeah. How long did it take to create the prototype, and then how long was it from there 
Man, it has been such a ride. You should have seen the first version was just like us literally coding inside the description of our first event page. Um, I gotta say, the whole time, I mean, from inception, God, man, it was uh, February 12th, February 20th, uh, 2012 was the first splash page. And we've been working on this ever since in a very iterative process by putting it in the field and having people yell at us. It's the only way to build it, I think. I, I hope that answers your questions. Yeah, two, three years, give or take. Any other questions? Yeah. What's your next move? Like, do you just like, continue to focus on the Nah, man. Um, yeah, I'm happy to talk about that. It's um, so I love events. Obviously, I think what we're doing right now is the most meaningful thing that we're going to do with our day, right? Uh, so I really do believe that there's an opportunity to help people discover those events. Um, I also think that people see the world through one view, which is brands. Um, and I happen to power the events of the greatest brands in the world. Um, so we're going to be working on an opportunity to help people follow those brands. Um, I will say, though, there's a lot of things we need to do to make sure that people can express themselves visually um, and to market their events um, before we're kind of at that stage. But we're working on it. And we, uh, we got, it's crazy, we got 40 people now. We're working fast, faster than I ever worked. And it's way harder with more people. But it's more fun. Yeah. Cool? Yeah. Oh, thank Guys, you. thanks so much.